culture that is increasingly skeptical about thinking deeply about unfamiliar or different points of view and appreciating things like uh, nuance, which, you know, Americans aren't always comfortable with that kind of gray area. I'm trying to get that this meeting is being recorded off of my screen, but it's not really, uh, oops, okay. Um, so uh, in some ways, can you all see this without that this meeting is being recorded? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in some ways, addressing issues of race or politics or gender and writing about art is a safer space to engage with these issues than a political or an ideological dialogue. So this is a portion of a 1956 Gordon Park image. He's an African-American photographer who worked a lot um, around civil wars in the 50s. It was actually shot in Atlanta. General misunderstanding of what criticism is. For many people, they think of our critics, especially in the role to decide, you know, what good a critic so, um uh shows the art but it is for everyone uh it has left all of us about it Um, exhibition for me in only it's a component of the job but only telling an audience whether this work is good or bad kind of it stops the discussion so in a case like this um, reviewing a photography show of Gordon Parks work um, it's often a better story to talk about Gordon Parks through the lens of race in America and how his work takes images you know in the segregated south and how he made those images for Life Magazine and how the images he took in the 50s actually give us a window, but show us the impact of these issues. The African-American woman holding the baby with a obvious owner of the baby <laughs> sitting next to her. Um, I think images like that are incredibly nuanced and complex. They show this incredible surreality of segregation and how it created bizarre scenarios of both intimacy and dehumanization expressed in this photograph. So Gordon often takes the advantage of the black subjects of his photographs so that we often feel the emotional impact of racism rather than simply seeing a record of it as in like a conventional you know civil rights image of a demonstration or something like that so this is just a quote from the ajc review um, that i did of his exhibition and what I think I was trying to get at in my review is how we can exist in a system of injustice and cruelty and not even recognize it, try to consign it to the history books and say it lives in the past, which then allows us to ignore present injustices. So artwork like Parks is completely relevant to our day to day. It keeps us aware of how life is experienced by other people and how it is, their experience is as valid as our own subjective experiences. This is true across the board with art. It's, it's not just about race, it could be about gender, it can be about anything and, and living for a moment in someone else's reality. I really believe that looking at art trains your eye and your mind to ponder realities and experiences outside of your own. So what this quote says to me is that what critics do is they take a visual phenomenon, whether it's a photograph or a painting or a piece of sculpture, and they break it down 
describe and dismantle it so we can better understand the object, but also how it relates to the world we live in. So in talking about an exhibition, you can talk about things like the techniques the artists use, the formal properties of the work, the artist's own life and experience, the historical moment when the work was made and its meaning over time and in our present moment. So that's all, you know, fair game for discussion. Um, some people kind of think that you do serve a role to do one sort of thing and not bring to bring to bear these um, socioeconomic forces in the world of the artist and your own. But I, I would disagree. Um, without critics, I think that art exists in a vacuum. You know, it's it's a closed loop experience by artists and curators and art insiders, and it has less potential to impart meaning beyond those parameters. So one thing that art and criticism help us do is reevaluate our reality and talk about whose worldview is shown in a particular piece. So this is um, a painting by the German artist um, Hans Memling called Vanity. And in the previous quote, John Berger talks, he's a a well-known British art critic. He talks about this painting, which is used much like other oil paintings to impart a message about death or temptation or sin or cowardice, what have you. But in this case, it is also a painting within a system of male controlled art and meaning making where women are sort of the traditional clay and men are the makers and female nudity is presented for the spectator's titillation and is sort of the natural state of being a woman is being nude. So the superficial moral lesson that Memling is presenting here about vanity is really used to distract from the fact that it's a visual enticement. It's a hot picture for the time of a naked lady. So, you know, what critics like John Berger do and what I hope to do is question the power structures and the belief systems that underpin images. Just as we uh, are trained to see the world from a certain point of view by the media or by popular culture, which reinforces gender roles or class structures, classical art from the 15th century like vanity can also reaffirm um, existing power structures. One thing um, that Nikki touched on that's really important to me about being an art critic in Atlanta is um, you're writing for a local newspaper. And I think it's important to spotlight the work of local artists and local galleries and museums. You know, these artists are not necessarily being written about or shown sometimes in other cities outside of Atlanta. And so for me, it's much more rewarding to speak to their gifts than propping up a visiting artist who already has an established career. I do a fair amount of that sort of writing, but to me, my value as a critic, the thing I'm the most proud of is talking about um, local artists work. So my writing also takes into account Atlanta as a place and Atlanta's unique history, the circumstance of living in the South and of artists making work outside of the major art centers of Los Angeles and New York. So these are all local artists. Um, I feel really passionate about showing the incredible talent this city has to offer um, and the wealth of creativity being done right here. So on the left is an image by photographer Jill Frank, upper right hand corner is William Downs, lower right is a painting by Gerald Lavelle. This is a montage of work by Sheila Pre Bright, Catherine Taylor, Angela West, again, all local artists. Um, artists in Atlanta like Sheila Pre Bright are examining beauty standards using a mashup of a Barbie doll face and a real girl's face to comment on unrealistic beauty standards. And work like Angela West's on the lower right is kind of a part of a documentary series that she's done about her own father. It's kind of a study of the complexity and unknowability the small surprises of his personality revealed in her photographs. So 
as a child with a dad, I totally relate to that work and that experience of your father sometimes being an extraterrestrial who you're trying to figure out. Um, so those are all of those artists. This is another local artist, Unique Norman. She um, is doing a really interesting project, a strange, slightly terrifying um, examination of America's first ladies. And in the process, she's questioning the feminine, feminine ideal, uh, the sense of proper or good behavior, American decorum and gentility represent, represented by first ladies and how that hides some of the uglier aspects of American life and a power structure whose existence requires a class, a class of people be denied access to power. So Jacqueline Kennedy in this image, she's so synonymous with a kind of immaculate beauty and decorum. So this small gesture Unique takes of smearing her lipstick is really a way of subverting the system itself that defines femininity as only one kind of thing and that holds certain women up as exemplars of femininity while denying others that status. So this is another image of a first lady and she takes these um, photocopied images of ordinary, not famous, not first lady um, people and she uses those to kind of complicate the image of the first lady to, to create these kind of organisms of anonymous bodies that cover and blot out the first lady. So for me, art is also writing about art is about context. When writing criticism, I have to take into consideration where and how the artwork is presented and how something like a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat at the High Museum is essentially different than a piece of graffiti art on a downtown Atlanta wall, which is essentially different than a piece of public art created for a unique location. So I have to consider what feelings that placement might create in the viewer or the artwork's legitimacy or illegitimacy in terms of the viewer and how they should perhaps question what they see as art in the world. This is a battle that art critics fight daily. What is art? what defines art. So that's like a constant struggle to, to show that it's far more encompassing, I think, than people imagine. Um, also, how a work is presented in a space is a, a opportunity for discussion, whether that presentation is effective or flawed. And you can look online for my review of the current Banksy show to get my take on that. Um, so I think as a critic, you are constantly considering the work of art itself, but also the artist's intentions in the work and what the artwork conveys outside of those intentions. So this is a sculpture by an Atlanta artist, Joe Perrigin. It's called Brute Neighbors. You may have seen it as an installation. It was in the baggage claim area of Atlanta Hartsfield. They have since taken it down, but these, these insects are kind of mimicking the movements of the humans below um, scrambling for their bags. So it was kind of created to exist in that particular site. Um, and this is Joe's quote about the work and what it represents, um, which is one take on the work, his own interpretation of what it means. Um, but I have also, with a, a long history of writing about Joe's work, I've also come to see his work as far more expansive. His work is often about human encroachment into nature and also the kind of animalistic and brutal qualities of humankind that we try to deny in ourselves and kind of project onto the natural world. So these are myriad sort of meanings that you can apply to his work and the context um, in which the work is presented can foreground a particular meaning. In this case, you know, that's mad scrambling of the ants that echoes the mad scrambling of uh, the people below trying to find their bag. Uh, that's I, all I have. I will say my mom did not like that. <laughs> the ants art just because it creeped, out. but we didn't have the context like you were talking about. Um, so we were trying to figure out what the heck does it mean, but now I can go back and say, <laughs> that's supposed to be us scrambling. So thanks for the context. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great piece. It's a shame that it's not really there anymore. 
Yeah, I remember that traveling through the airport, seeing that. Um, and then it's interesting to so say you already wrote about Banksy. I, Banksy, we actually will be visiting that exhibit later in the semester and writing how we feel about the exhibit as well. What was your take on it overall? Well, don't read my review first then, but I will give you the <laughs> elevator pitch. Um, it's a completely surreal and weird experience to see an artist who is identified with subculture with questioning sort of social norms, with working in a public space wedged into underground Atlanta. And um, suddenly, you know, this sort of subcultural force comes within the umbrella of culture in a way that's very disconcerting. I won't even get into the issues of originality. A lot of the majority of the works are not actually of his, mm -hmm. of Banksy. They are reproductions. They have very few original works on view. He did not authorize the exhibition. It's, you know, it's a, it's a complicated story. And I try to be fair and talk about the, the flaws in some of the exhibition strategies that the organizers have used. They, there are a lot of issues with the way they, um, write about the work on their um, sort of titles and uh, educational materials. But I also recognize that something, someone like Banksy represents something for like a younger audience. And if it, if this show can kind of open them up to the idea of rebellion and, and fighting the power, then I'm okay with that too. So it's complicated, I guess, is my yeah. Well, uh, we'll see where we get out. If, we, if anybody in the class will get that as well. <laughs> um, I do want to leave time for questions for Melissa and Felicia. Um, what questions do you all have about either one? Covering art, covering music as an art form, as a journalist in general? Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Uh, I did have a question about art. And then music as well. But for the art portion, at what you mentioned that it's more of a democratic process, but at what point does it turn less democratic and more authoritarian? And I say democratic process in that I want it to be democratic. I want people to understand that art is not an elite pursuit, it is for everyone and everyone's interpretation. So I just feel like, especially in the South, I'm always fighting a battle because a lot of people are uncomfortable in a museum setting or a gallery setting. So I'm always being a little bit of an advocate for this work is for you. Um, I think the art world is meant, and for many people, is authoritarian. I think people are, they feel like critics and artists and museum culture is about telling them what's good for them and what to appreciate and what to denigrate. And I question that entire system because, you know, as I said, it's it's for everyone. Thank you. What else? I have a question uh, for uh, either Philippe or uh, Melissa. Um, we enjoyed it. And I guess I, I want to know, like, what types of things do you do both of you do to kind of like make your articles like conversational, um, where it's like you're having like a dialogue with um, the reader and like what, what types of, yeah, like what types of um, like tips or advice do you have on like how to like develop that, that type of style of writing? Actually, can Melissa take that one? Because she's really, not to say that Felicia isn't, but I, I feel like Melissa, you've kind of, I feel like you've done that really well having worked well, with uh Uh, happy birthday. You know, I, I have the best advice that I got from my mentor, Deb, who I talked about earlier, was to write how you talk. And she and I both had similar backgrounds and that, you know, my family's from New York. She's from New York. Um, I'm, I'm Italian. She's Jewish. We both grew up with these very like chatty families, I guess you could say. And I try to be as conversational as possible in my writing. And I in my head, I almost have this internal dialogue, like 
if I were sitting with my friends talking about, you know, hey, have you heard this album? It's actually really good. And here's why, you know, I really like this song because I loved what they did with the bass line on that. Or, you know, I don't know, I was really disappointed in the sound of that. I thought they were going to go a different direction and it didn't really work for me. And I try to take that and put it into words that sound a little more polished than what you might be saying when you're, when you're sitting and, and talking with your friends. But I always have that in the back of my mind. And sometimes I find myself, if I do find myself writing a review of something, and I think that sounds too mannerly. That doesn't sound like me. And I was actually really happy that when I came to USA Today a couple months ago, my, my first assignment, which was kind of out of left field, but I was like, okay, they wanted me to review the new Doja Cat album. And, you know, she's somebody that I, I'm familiar with as much as anybody, you know, she's fairly new, but I didn't have a huge, you know, wealth of knowledge about her. But when I wrote the review and my new editor said to me, I love your voice in this. And I just kind of went, <laughs> you know, thank God that came through because I was a little worried that maybe it didn't. And I was worried that I was going to be too hesitant to be myself because it was my first assignment for a, a new, a new paper. So just be you. you, you know, I mean, I know that sounds so simplistic, but you, you want to, you want to engage the people who are going to be reading you and make them feel like they know something about you. And when I was in Richmond for a long time, and then when I've been in Atlanta, was in Atlanta for a long time, when I would meet people out, you know, at events or whatever, they would sometimes say to me things like, oh, you're actually exactly how I thought you would be from reading your stuff all these years. And that's always kind of made me feel happy. Like, okay, so I got that, that came through in what I was writing. Appreciate that. I would, go ahead. I would just say to add to that, I totally agree. Um, the critics I love have a very strong voice and I follow them as if I know them because their voice is so strong. They're like a friend. Um, but what I think is really critical, especially early in your career is to have other people read something before it's published and give you feedback because they're a good barometer of this sounds stuffy this sounds you know too complex this sentence is too long etc cetera, etc cetera. i don't force my husband to read my work any longer but i did early on and that helped a lot but also just you're your own sort of critic and editor as well and i probably do five or six drafts of everything i put out into the world so going back reading your own work again and again and again to get it conversational, to get it factually right, to make it flow, to cut out the stuff. You know, they always say in journalism, kill your darlings. That one line you thought was so spectacular may not, you know, help the piece as a whole. So you may have to check that baby out. So that's just part of the the process, I think. Yeah, I, I would I definitely agree with you, Felicia, in being able to go back and look at what you said. Because when I talked about doing those uh, MTV VMA recaps very quickly the other night, I was literally <laughs> just like, this sucks because, you know, or, and then I'd go back and go, oh God, maybe I should have written that. Maybe I should, you know, but I didn't have time. I mean, sometimes, you know, and it depends what you're doing. I mean, obviously if, if you have time to sit and, and write something and do a couple drafts, that's ideal. But when, when you're doing something on deadline, sometimes, you know, you are just kind of coming up with whatever at the top of your head and you hope that you're not offending anybody that you go back and cringe a little. I mean, I really cringe too much about stuff I wrote, but I was sort of like, well, I could have worded that better or that could have been more polished or smoother. And had I had more than four minutes, <laughs> something, get up and walk away from what you're writing. I, I try and do that as much as I can when I've got the time, you know, uh, like Felicia said, you know, do a couple of drafts of something and just leave it and go get a drink, go sit down, go for a walk, go something. And then when you come back, you're looking at it as, new again and you're going to pick up things that you didn't after, you may have read it 47 times before but when you come back after not seeing it for a few minutes or a half hour or whatever you go oh hmm, okay cool i didn't see that now i do i do the same i usually do my last draft before i go to sleep and then i wake up early the next morning when it's really fresh to read it and find all of these weird things that i then have to redo so i totally agree with that Mm -hmm. And your experience of live blogging the Grammy sounds terrifying. Uh, yeah, it, it was a little <laughs> terrifying, actually. That was the fastest.
I've ever had to do anything. And I used to think I was pretty fast, but I'm really not compared to some of these people. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it, both of you. Thank you. Sure. Can I ask uh, one more question? Of course. Um, for Melissa, but with, I guess when you go to the concerts and, and all with music, where's the press box well, normally? Like? At concerts, we don't have a press box. Uh, that's a good question because I did bring up sports writers who are funneled right into a press box. I am just given tickets. They are usually good tickets. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, so they're, they, they usually reserve, depending on what city you're in. If you're in a pretty big city like Atlanta or I, when I was in Richmond, I used to cover stuff in D.C., which is where I live, where I just moved a few weeks ago. Um, if you're in a big enough market, they'll usually reserve maybe a row that they will then have media tickets available for anybody who's coming to cover the show. So when I was in Richmond, you know, it would probably be me and the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun and maybe one other, you know, creative loafing type publication. Uh, same in Atlanta, it would usually be, you know, me, sometimes um, the um, app, Gwinnett Daily Post, sometimes creative loafing. And so we would usually all be sitting together in the same row and the promoter Usually, sometimes they come through the promoter. Sometimes they come through the publicist. It sort of depends on the artist, and you know. But they they do mark a certain number of tickets for most performances. Now, interestingly, with COVID and shows being so weird over the last year and a half, and you know, they're not having been shows for a very long time. I've noticed, and I, I'm not doing as quite as much concert coverage at USA Today as I have in the past, but I've noticed that a lot of promoters are either not like allowing photographers. I, I know in Atlanta, they weren't able to send a photographer to a few shows that normally would have been just not even really not even a question of whether or not we could send somebody. And they might not, you know, a lot of times they'll give you a pair of tickets to cover something. I'm actually covering um, in Vegas this Saturday is the kickoff of the Enrique Iglesias, Ricky Martin tour. And so I'm covering that and they are giving me a pair of tickets so I could bring a friend. That used to be the norm, but also with COVID, a lot of places, a lot of shows are only giving just the reviewer a ticket, which is fine. I mean, you know, you can't really expect them to <laughs> let you bring your friend or your spouse with you every time you go to a show. Um, but just for, you know, keeping crowd control, that kind of, that kind of thing. Also, it saves them money. So there's also that. Thank you. Hopefully they go back to the norm on that one. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they actually are pretty good tickets. I've, I've done like the Alvin Ailey it's usually like right it's not maybe not front row but like it's close close enough good seat um do you guys have any other questions we have just a literally a couple more minutes if anybody had any other questions i hope you got a chance to really just take in what they said about being conversational um can you guys hear me <laughs> it's not just us. No, she froze. What I was going to say, usually, um, they, they need you to be in a place where you can either hear or see those back so you can, you can, you know, have a pretty good vantage point of the stage because, you know, they want you, of course, to write positive things about whatever it is that you're covering. So they, they, they're not going to make you miserable and put you in the last row of the balcony because then you could very easily say, well, I didn't see that. How could you, you know, you put me up there. How could I, how could I really see what I was supposed to be writing about? Sorry, Nikki, you froze. So I just kept talking. Can you hear me? You're back, I think. Okay. Uh, the Wi-Fi is spotty here. I don't know why. Uh, okay. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you guys mind if, if if any of the students want to reach out, have any further questions? Not at all. Okay. Um, yeah. So I just I'll share I'll share at the very least Melissa's. You can let me know, Felicia, if you're okay with that as well. Oh, of course, yes, happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, so you have you they've been listening to a podcast called Seeing White. So so far, we think we've done like eleven episodes or around there, and this this is what they're going to do. They're going to take a a critical look at the podcast and share beyond that this is what the podcast the podcast essentially talks about that race is, is structured and it's, it's not a biological innate thing that we as people structured it for particular reasons um, and so yeah hopefully that this gives you some type of insight I, I wrote an assignment with it I gave like nine steps just broke it down and said this is what I want you to focus on um, but I wanted them to hear from real critics because I've never been a critic. I've edited critics, but to actually do the work is, is a totally different ballgame. So I appreciate both of your insight. 
And if that's it, um, this is recorded and I'll, well, let me rephrase that. <laughs> Felicia's is recorded, <laughs> forgot to record Melissa. Um, but I did take notes of Melissa. That, I don't love you any less though, Melissa. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> I hate that. Oh, I'm so awesome. sorry. Have... No, it's, it's totally cool. But if you guys have any questions when, I don't know what you're, what they're gonna be writing, Nikki, but if right. you have any questions that maybe I said something too fast, or I know I actually didn't give a whole lot about my background as far as you know, education and stuff, feel free to drop me an email and I'm, I'm happy to respond to anything. Yeah, I'll share, I'll share Same. your-, your... Feaster at bellsouth.net, but Nikki will share that with you. I will, I will. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you for being timely. And if you have any questions um, for Melissa, Felicia, reach out. If you have any questions for me and you'll hear from me on Blackboard and email, um, probably within the next 24 hours. Cool? All right, thank you guys. I'll talk to you thank all you. soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your great questions. Yes, yeah. thanks guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.